This is the Plant Powered Challenge 2022, brought to you by Spectrum Health's Lifestyle Medicine Team. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the 2022 Plant Powered Challenge. We are excited to hear from our board certified lifestyle medicine physicians who are also parents as they share their personal experience and encouragement on raising a plant powered family. We will begin by talking with Dr. Nick Stefanov, who is a veteran family doctor with additional board certification in lifestyle medicine. After losing 40 pounds, Dr. Stefanov was inspired to make food and movement part of his medical arsenal. This journey has led him to be one of the physicians on the frontier of curing chronic disease at Spectrum Health's lifestyle medicine practice. Dr. Stefanov has four young children, including a newborn, and he is here today to answer some of our questions surrounding snacking and role modeling while raising a plant-powered family. Dr. Stefanov has four young children, including a newborn at home, and he's here to talk with us about raising a plant-powered family and some of the challenges that come along with that. Dr. Stefanov, thank you for taking some time to, to talk with us about this. I'm a dad of young children as well, and I want to know how do you get the kids to cooperate? What are, what are some of the challenges that you face while living this lifestyle in your home? Well, thanks, Leon. Um, I'll tell you, one of the challenges when we started out is we were living in rural New Mexico, and our little town just had one uh, family-owned grocery store in the whole town. So uh, finding, you know, quinoa, nutritional yeast, these uh, plant-based delicacies uh, wasn't always an option. But they did have some fantastic avocados and green chili. Um, what happened, of course, is that we had more kids and we had to move closer to the grandparents, right? And that became um, a little obstacle, too. Um, not all our family members were... Um, uh, liked so much the philosophy, the food philosophy we had for our kids. And it took some time, but, you know, with communication and love and respect, we have made progress. And um, I'm so appreciative to all our grandparents. But, like, the, eventually, um, as they saw us doing it and learned about some of, the, some of the science behind it and just the common sense approach of, you know, more fruits and vegetables, we got our grandmas now, they're making oatmeal for our kids, they're making smoothies, maybe even made tofu, which is, I don't think, something they've ever uh, done before they were cooking for our family. Um, one thing we've been working on even more recently is at the school, you know, there's some uh, unhealthy foods to get introduced at the school. Uh, so we're working on some of those snacks and things too. You know, a lot of us like to think that doctors have all the answers and the magic potion to just about everything. Uh, what are some of the challenges you face with the kids themselves? I mean, my kids sometimes just don't want to eat something that's green. Yes, and um, that important question um, has a lot of sort of components to the answer. Just like every child has their own unique disposition and personality and uh, uh, environment that they're in at the time, and their age, of course, too. Um, and so it, it kind of depends. But there are um, some good strategies that we can use. So uh, let me just outline a couple here. Um, one is, uh, well, geez, speaking of snacks, um, letting the child get hungry will help them eat healthier food. Uh, we were struggling with our two-year-old after we started eating healthier. You know, he wasn't as accustomed to it. And my wife ended up uh, listening to an audiobook, French Kids Eat Everything. And one of the main points is that in their culture, um, kids aren't as picky, perhaps because snacking is not part of their culture. And so we tried that. We reduced food between meals, and the kids were hungry when it was time to eat, and so they were a lot more open. And we, st we also start with uh, maybe the less appealing foods and then bring in the... Uh, uh, the favorites a little later in the meal as like a second course and the, and the kids will, you know, nowadays they're finishing their salad before they move on to um, whatever, like whole grain pasta or something that we have as their second course. Um, I want to point out a couple other things too. Uh, role modeling, super important. So just doing it yourself. We know the kids are really watching us and 
um, learning from us and sometimes mimicking us for better or for worse. Uh, so showing them that we enjoy and seek out and appreciate and are grateful for the healthy food that we eat is also really important. Um, and it helps make it normal too. So one time we were at the Pulaski Days Festival and um, there was like a, a clown putting on a magic show with 15 kids sitting in front of him and this clown is, he's trying to make a joke and he says, like, hey kids, who wants some broccoli? And my kids all go, oh yeah, broccoli. Uh, and the clown, you know, gives him this double take, like uh, he was a little uh, uh, taken aback for a minute there um, because it was just normal for the kids to, like if they're hungry, heck yeah, they, they want broccoli. Um, but you know, it, I, I prescribe a lot of vegetables to patients and most people do actually like broccoli. Broccoli is pretty, a pretty appealing superfood. Uh, so it can be normal and, and we can help make it normal for the kids. And you know, I have to imagine that um, you, in some ways it has to feel like an uphill battle to some degree because you're fighting against a lot of marketing. Uh, every kid knows what the golden M looks like for McDonald's. Um, do you feel like you're fighting against the world in some ways on this with your family? Yeah, um, it's true. Our food culture is unhealthy and um, it does feel like we're being sabotaged or undermined sometimes. Um, and uh, boy, oh boy, you know, when we lose touch with sort of the battle for good health, um, we tend to backslide. Uh, so it does require sort of constant attention and investment. Um, gee, you know, one, like I mentioned the school before, uh, we were becoming so frustrated, my wife and I, at the junk food that the kids were getting at school. And we love our school. They're, they're a fantastic school. And how it worked out is a testament to the teachers that they have that eventually we decided, okay, we want to reach out to these teachers to, re to reduce the junk that they're, that they're getting, the treats and the snacks, or at least make them healthier, right? And we were afraid of the reaction that these, you know, teachers that are really busy and we're entrusting our kids to, like, and now we're adding, we're asking for an additional sort of burden on them. But actually, they were very open to it. Um, and I think not just because they're excellent teachers that care about the children, but um, I think a lot of teachers are probably, they're, in the, they're thinking the same thing that the parents are thinking, like, oh, geez, if I try to feed these, these kids um, cutie oranges um, and, and carrots or, or something healthy, like, and they turn it down, am I going to be in trouble with the parents? But So all it took was a little dialogue, you know, asking, um, c politely and kindly um, and offering to help. You know, we sometimes bring healthy snacks in um, for the teachers to share with our children. And, um, and right away, you know, a child that's fed a candy bar versus an orange, um, their behavior is going to be better, even, even in the next few minutes, not to mention, you know, geez, for the rest of their life, um, and there's, there's good evidence, too, showing how fruits and vegetables improve someone's mood um, and, you know, regulate their circulation and um, affect their sleep-wake cycle and all these things. So, um, so with, with some effort, um, the, the culture of unhealthy food can be uh, pushed back against one of the things you said that was interesting, Dr. Stefanoff, was about the role of hunger. I think a lot of parents uh, feel that their job is to make sure their kids are never hungry. We don't want our kids to be hungry. But you're saying that that's an important piece of this. So uh, is that a, a hard, fast recommendation, no snacking? Or are there times where snacking is appropriate? That's a great question. And I think a really important insight for us to consider um, the sensation of hunger is often, I dare say usually, rather um, an appetite for stimulation or consolation or, or pleasure. Um, snacking, basically after a year old, human beings don't really need snacks anymore. And um, I think it makes sense to us that 
looking back, you know, for thousands of years, human beings have, have survived after a long winter, missing meals, um, and, uh, and we're okay for that. So certainly going four, six, eight hours without food is not harmful to health. Um, it's, it's the junk foods that are harmful to health. Um, so what, what, the, what the hunger is, let me talk about that a little more. Um, when we eat something intensely pleasurable, especially something sugary, it makes us a little bit high. And there are functional MRI studies showing the effect on the brain neurochemically of, of um, these foods or... Um, and as we come down from that high, we, we want more of it. Um, and, this, and children are particularly vulnerable, I think, to this process. And also, um, what I say by consolation, I mean when there's stress or boredom. And certainly kids get stressed sometimes. And certainly food can be uh, a way to sort of console ourselves, um, but not a healthy way. And so what, what I propose is that as parents, we will do our best when we teach our children to deal with their emotions and stresses and boredom in healthy ways by moving or communicating or expressing themselves through art. Um, and that, that has all these wonderful benefits of building character and improving communication skills and leaving them hungry for the healthy food at their next meal. You know, and as if the challenge wasn't enough, uh, another part of the marketing machine is the advertisement of healthy. Uh, marketers know that that is something that parents are concerned about. But there are some foods that are marketed with labels that might make you think they're healthy that we know are not healthy. Uh, do you have some examples of those and, and what can help parents uh, navigate around that hurdle in this? Yeah, for sure. You can't trust... <clears throat> You can't trust the, the title label, right? I like to look at the ingredient list. And, oh man, how about this example? These like protein packs of cheese and beef jerky. You know, um, the, or like, a, it's like, it's like some kind of power food. But what power is it giving kids? There's no, there's no um, evidence or even really scientific basis to think that cheese and beef jerky are going to make kids better learners or healthier in any way. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a processed fat, basically. Um, and especially something like uh, jerky, which processed meat is well established to be um, a carcinogen. Uh, eating, eating beef jerky is roughly equivalent to like a day of uh, secondhand smoke when it comes to cancer risk. Um, so, so yes, we can't just trust the title label as something as healthy. We need to have a little bit of smarts so, and knowledge so that we can um, protect and, and help our children in, a, in an effective way. Dr. Stefanoff, I want to give parents something uh, tangible to take away from this. Uh, when we talk about snacks, what are some of your kids' favorites, some of the staples that you keep in your house for snacks? For sure. Because we do use, we use snacks, oh yeah, um, and they're usually whole fruits and vegetables, which are the best. Um, we all most often uh, are giving snacks to our kids, like um, when meals are just kind of weirdly timed, when we're traveling, you know, going on an airplane, or going someplace where we know there won't be much healthy food, and so it's like, all right, we're going to kind of like appetize ourselves here with... Um, before we arrive and then have the pizza or, um, or turkey or whatever. Um, we like, have you ever had um, sugar snap peas, Leon? No. Oh boy, well try them out next time if they're, if they're fresh. Uh, these are like, they're kind of like um, fresh um, uh, green beans, a little bit sweet, a little bit salty, um, delicious, awesome snack, sugar snap peas. Baby carrots dipped in hummus, uh, just delicious. Cherry tomatoes are a great snack. Um, basically any kind of whole fruit. And berries, there's a ton of varieties of delicious berries. Apples, especially when they're in season. Pears. Um, oh, you know what, what snack kids love? 
is nuts and seeds, which uh, we adults have to be a little more cautious about all the fat and calories in them, but kids can go be a little more loose about it. Um, but like cashews, almonds, walnuts, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, kids love those. They have this natural draw to more calorie dense foods. And um, so nuts and seeds are just a really great choice. So if we're going on like um, a road trip to my parents' house on the east side of the state and, um, and you know, it's going to, they're going to be kind of too late to dinner. Maybe we'll give them each like a cup or a bowl with some baby carrots and some cherry tomatoes and uh, some cashews. Uh, and we'll be on our way and they can munch on it in the car. Um, but oh, there's so many great things too. Mini bell peppers and sliced cucumber. and uh, It goes on and on. There are lots of great choices too. Simple, quick, um, just not, not with, you know, like a 10-year shelf life. Um, but definitely doable for, for virtually any family. You know, I imagine one of the biggest hurdles for a family, especially one that's trying to transition to uh, this lifestyle, is going to be that initial switchover. How do you recommend parents introduce this or start this with their kids? I mean, do you think there should be a hard stop or is this something that's got to take uh, weeks or months or gradual? What, are your, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it probably depends on the family and especially the age of the kids. Um, I think for older kids, they probably need some kind of investment in it, both um, cognitively and with the choices that surround the creation and consumption of food in the home. Uh, for littler kids, we can be more proscriptive, but forgiving, so maybe more gradual transition, especially if they're old enough to kind of see the difference and know what's going on. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of parents do have success kind of sneaking the foods in, um, in decreasingly obvious ways, uh, just to build sort of the, the, the palate for it and kind of make the nutrition happen uh, with or without the kids' involvement. But at the, at the end of the day, um, it's best if we can help the children kind of understand um, that the nutrition is good and it makes them feel better and that we are doing it the, ourselves because we think it's important. So there's kind of this sense of um, unity and love that like, okay, this is a good thing. We're doing it together and, you know, we'll work through some of the problems um, while being, you know, while allowing uh, maybe some of the old indulgences at first or making a gradual transition, uh, depending on, you know, where the child is at and what their sort of needs and preferences and moods are at the time. I recognize that what we're feeding our kids is, is really only part of the component of this. And I, I think to something uh, now with a little bit of guilt that uh, I did just today, I took my kid to the doctor, said, you know, if you behave for the doctor, I'm going to give you some ice cream after. And is that setting up a bad relationship with food for our kids? And also, I think if we were to be trying to make the kind of changes that you're recommending, saying, uh, I'm going to give you some carrots and hummus after the appointment doesn't <laughs> seem like it would work too well, at least not right off the bat. Uh, is, is using food as a reward, is that, is that something you recommend against? And, and how do you go about changing that relationship um, that is sometimes unhealthy between uh, our kids, us, and food? Oh boy. You know, I hate to say, yeah, it's bad, but yeah, it's bad. Um, because I, I, we do it too a little bit, you know. Um, I think, I think food, um, indulgent food is great for like feasting and celebration and special occasions, um, but not the, the healthiest for a reward. Um, so boy, I, I, I'd much rather give my kids like a sticker or toy or um, words of praise or uh, some other kind of like allowance. Um, heck, my second-year-old, you know, he's, he's, he's excited about money intermittently. 
Um, so yeah, best, best not to use the food as a reward, even though it's super convenient to do so. Um, but that doesn't leave us without options, you know, and if, I, I don't know, if we do it a little bit, it's not, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. Um, as parents, we're always kind of trying to figure out, you know, how to encourage our kids or discourage them, uh, you know, from doing bad things. And so, um, so yeah, let's all work on our toolboxes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Decide so it's not always ice cream for everything. <laughs> and and if you're feed and if if my parents are feeding their kids ice cream as a reward for seeing me, they better, you know, just not even mention it in my hearing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Stefanoff, we know we wouldn't call it the plant power challenge if it was easy. Uh, so it is yeah. a challenge. And uh, thanks for sharing some advice on on how folks can uh, can implement um, the, this ideology in their families and help them to, uh, especially our kids, have a healthier future. Dr. Nick Stefanoff, thank you so much. Well, thanks, Leon. Appreciate you. And good luck, everyone. Wow, it sure was great hearing from Dr. Stefanoff and about his journey in raising a plant-powered family. We'll now hear from one of his colleagues who also has young children at home. Dr. Carolyn Vollmer is a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician who is also board certified in lifestyle medicine. She's a mom of three little boys and knows firsthand what it's like to plantzition a family's eating habits. Dr. Vollmer, thanks for joining us. We are excited to hear more about your journey in raising a plant-based family. Uh, if we can, start with a little bit about your personal story, uh, whether the plant-based lifestyle is a new thing for you or you've done it for a long time, and tell us about your journey and transition into that lifestyle. Well, I can honestly say it's been a gradual process for me over the course of my lifetime. Um, I grew up like many of our patients on the standard American diet. You know, lots of fast food as a kid, meat, potatoes, vegetables for dinner. Um, in high school and college, we got some nutrition, um, and even in med school, we got some nutrition education. But I found myself easily confused by all of the fad diets too, like Atkins or doing a juice cleanse with some friends. Never really felt that healthy on any of these dietary patterns, but um, you know, continued on my journey of at least moving my body for exercise. And then when I was in residency in California, I began to be exposed to more um, flavors and ethnic cuisines, and I found myself gravitating towards more of a Mediterranean pescatarian lifestyle and started to eliminate animal-based meats in my diet. I felt better, but I was still eating a lot of dairy and processed foods. So still hadn't really found what really fit long-term for myself. Um, and when I moved back to Grand Rapids, somehow I stumbled upon the specialty of lifestyle medicine and um, began to research the evidence of plant-based nutrition and the power of it. Um, looked at the research behind why it's so beneficial for prevention and reversal of disease, you know, read books by Dr. Greger, How Not to Die, How Not to Diet, um, attended conferences then to kind of further my education on it um, at Harvard, and I met Dr. Arts actually at a conference in uh, Orlando, Florida. We had an initial connection, and during this whole time of, you know, exploring and eating, I was changing my diet myself. So I began really amplifying fruits and vegetables and whole grains, nuts, seeds in my diet and started to push away dairy products, eventually eliminated it. At that point in my life, I honestly felt like the healthiest version of myself. Um, within the last few years, I can say that after having three kids, I feel better than ever. My energy is the best. My skin feels better. Um, I've lost weight and it's the best part is that it's, I feel like it's sustainable. Um, it's something I don't want to change. I don't have food addictions anymore. Um, and I feel like it gives me that kind of credibility with my patients that together we are on this journey of improving our lifestyles and I've done it. We can celebrate you know, our successes, and work through the challenges. And I think it's important for a physician to walk the talk. Um, that they do with their patients, and it's great for the relationships and really enjoying working with patients in lifestyle medicine. Uh, I'm curious, in your transition, what were your biggest 
uh, hurdles, struggles. Do any of those struggles remain now or is it now just second nature and easy? It's become second nature and easier with time. Um, I don't have like those cravings for sugar anymore. Um, you know, the candy drawer or sweets. I can walk by a cake and not pick it up. It, it's, it's incredible to be on this side and I know a lot of us struggle with it. And so using the plant-based nutrition and really amplifying these powerful foods um, has allowed me to avoid the foods that are, are less beneficial for my health. So you're saying you're at the point where you walk by a steak or a cake and you go, meh, yuck. Yes, isn't it crazy? But it, it's true, it's true. I, I can, I feel confident in my decisions. I feel healthy um, and I want our patients to feel the same way. And so that's why I love what I do with this team. And I'm surrounded by an excellent team of you know dietitians, health coaches, the doctors I work with are all very involved. And we just, we all get it and we just wanna help everybody else. Let's talk about leading a plant-based lifestyle with children, because I imagine that's an entirely different set of challenges. You've got three boys. Uh, what are some of the ways that you get them to get on board with this, and how do you get them to cooperate? Yeah, so, you know, kids can be by nature picky eaters, so I tend not to, um, you know, overanalyze things. I introduce foods on multiple occasions to see if they will like it, and if you need to, you can hide fruits and vegetables in things like smoothies, or I'll mix them into like a whole wheat pasta or spaghetti to make sure they get those nutrients that they need. Um, and then we also meal plan a lot. So we try and think about um, incorporating foods in that putting half of their plate full of vegetables and making sure there's a lot of fruits on their plate alongside, you know, easy recipes like beans and rice or whole wheat pasta or make your own pizza nights are great options. Can you share with us some of the favorites that your kids have uh, that fit in line with the lifestyle you're promoting? Yeah, so a lot of times we will um, try and keep things easy and fast for our kids. So like I mentioned, like a whole wheat pasta or a whole wheat spaghetti, take some plant-based cheese, put it on top or an easy tomato sauce is one simple meal. We got an air fryer, which has been a great investment for us. So we'll do like a pizza toast or have a pizza night. Kids love to dip things. So um, making tofu sticks and allowing them to dip like a nugget is a great source of calcium and protein for kiddos. And like I said, the air fryer, you can also do things like fries, sweet potato fries, um, instead of the original fries and allow you not to deep fry them. There's some good and easy options. And of course with this, you are kind of fighting against um, some major marketing machines out there, uh, the fast food industry, uh, a lot of the uh, items we see in the grocery store are, are targeted toward uh, our children. Uh, how do you uh, fight against that when those kids uh, see things that are designed to make them want them and they want them? Correct. Um, you know, we try and introduce our kids and talk to them about how food makes them feel and that we're fueling their body with good gasoline for their tanks. And so certainly kids are exposed to these foods here and there, but we try not to make them an, a common occurrence. So for example, like with fast food, we will avoid it if we can at all costs. And because we know that fast food is addictive, like you said, there's a lot of marketing at play to get our kids to eat fast food. So the less they eat it, the less they crave it. And so, the other way, thing I talk about is always being ready to feed your kids on the go. So keeping peanut butter sandwiches, snacks in the car, or putting together those easy 15 minute meals for your kiddos when you get home, knowing that driving through the drive-through can take sometimes just as long as it is to whip up a meal at home. Another concern for a lot of families is the cost of this. Uh, unhealthy food is oftentimes cheaper. Um, are there any cost-saving ways that, that you can suggest um, folks who want to live a plant-based lifestyle? Yes, and we found, you know, with three growing boys, my husband jokes that we might need a dump truck of Costco to come to our house. And so Costco or some of these big stores, we buy in bulk to save money. So buying chickpeas and beans and rice, whole grains, 
frozen fruits and vegetables alongside fresh fruits and vegetables when they're cost effective is a great way to do it. But you can put frozen um, fruits in smoothies. We keep frozen veggies on stock at home to quickly whip out and put on the dinner uh, table. We also enjoy places like Trader Joe's. It's a smaller grocery store, but has some really cost-effective options for some good plant-based source proteins, like tofu, tempeh, things that not everybody's um, typically you know, used to cooking with, but when you buy it at a cheaper price point, you might be more likely to incorporate it. Okay, we know that what we're eating is just part of the equation. Also staying active and leading a lifestyle that involves exercise is also a key part of this. Can you weigh in on that? Yeah. So. You know, we have to lead by example with our kiddos and they're, what we realize is they're always watching us. So I try and make exercise a part of my daily routine and try to do it before my kids wake up so it doesn't take away from time with them. But if, we're, if not, the kids and I always try and do something physical as part of our time we spend together. So hikes on the weekends, it could be sledding. Or, you know, even in the winter time, there's a lot of indoor events if it's safe and you feel comfortable doing you know, kids' sporting events, there are opportunities for indoor swimming, or in the summertime, there's free events that Grand Rapids puts on, like the Grand Rapids Kids Marathon, that you can do as a family, walk or jog, just to keep kids physically active. You know, and, and, and as we talk about these things, especially with the children, you know, we're talking about it in a way that uh, sort of makes it sound easy. And I'm just imagining, I have three boys also, if we tried to take away some of the candies and whatnot that, that they're used to having, there might be a real struggle in our house. Uh, are there moments where it's like that for you? What are, what are some of the ways to get through the times where it's really hard? I think that I always talk about how, talk with my kids and be honest about how does eating a food make you feel? And I really encourage them to be in tune with their bodies. So for example, my six-year-old said, he got into his grandpa's candy um, chocolate drawer and he ate a bunch of chocolate over the Thanksgiving holiday. And that night he said to me, Mom, I don't feel good. I, th I think, I honestly, I think I ate too much chocolate today. And I said, well, you know, instead of yelling at him, I said, well, you know, that's good you realize that maybe next time not so much chocolate or you'll pick something else that fuels your body and makes you feel good. And so he can start to develop a healthy relationship with food and from an early on age. And I, grant, I understand that you don't get to start with kids at an early age in all scenarios, but um, just encouraging that healthy relationship and inviting your kids, exposing them to other food groups. And then, like we said, leading by example, trying yourself to eat as much of the foods and they're always watching. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, balancing our kids' lives because we've talked about some of the food issues, uh, staying active as another concern. There's also a mental health issues, especially during what we're all going through right now. Uh, how do you maintain that balance in your kids' lives uh, that allows them to lead a healthy lifestyle and be the best person that we can encourage them to be? Yes, I think that at the foundation of this, sleep is really key, you know, and kids uh, do well with routine. And so helping your kids remain as consistent in a routine as possible, um, despite some of the things that are ever changing in our environments can be really helpful for them at this time. So setting a consistent bedtime, getting your kids outside to play in the afternoon, regardless of the weather, can really help to um, promote their natural sleep drive to stay on schedule and then cutting out screen time before bedtime, like we do for adults. We say, you know, don't put on the TV before bed so they go to bed easily. And one thing that I think about now compared to like when we were growing up is the exposure to social media and um, cell phones being omnipresent with parents and focusing on putting your cell phone away as a parent or in the other room and really taking that time to look your kids in the eyes and connect with them and listen to what happened during the day. Asking meaningful questions is really valuable and meaningful to help you know, build relationships with our children and make them feel comfortable to share things with us. You know, the other question I have about, um, you know, with the kids is you, of course, are not the only person that has an opportunity to feed your kids. Uh, they go to birthday parties, they go to other family members' homes. Um, how do you deal with getting them to uh, stay healthy in those environments. Yeah, and I think that you 
need to allow them to still have these opportunities so that's not like a rebellious behavior that develops when they go out. So things that we think about with adults, we can do with our kids as well. So if we're going to a birthday party or a Christmas or Thanksgiving or other holiday event, I will pre-feed my children with healthier nutritious options like an apple or a plate full of vegetables, which I know they may not be getting at the birthday party. And at least I know that I have filled up their bellies with some nutritious foods to start, so they're less likely to overindulge when they actually get to the party. So do you not have like any hard, fast rules where like my kids are not allowed to eat X? I try to not have hard, fast rules with those kinds of things. I, I really keep some of the foods out of our house that I know are more addictive like try and not stocking cakes and candies and processed foods in the home so that there isn't that drive to keep eating it and wanting it. Um, and certainly I will not keep as much animal-based meats or dairy products in the house. Um, but if they're out and about and they're at a birthday party and they have a piece of pizza, I'm not going to um, you know, make them feel bad about this, but we'll talk about how they felt afterwards and then continue to build healthy relationships with foods. So there are bound to be people who have heard what you're talking about and go, this is just too much, not going to be possible. Uh, what are your words of encouragement um, in those situations? I'm sure this happens with your patients too. Yeah, and I think we always in our team focus of meeting you where you're at. And it's all about learning new things and doing it gradually, like how I mentioned earlier, how I've incorporated this into my life over time and into my husband's and our children's lives. Um, and we make small changes together as with my patients and as our, with the team. So we'll find what you need. So maybe it's learning how to cook differently or learning easy recipes for your kiddos. We'll meet you where you're at give you ideas and strategies, and then you know help you along the way. All right, Dr. Carolyn Vollmer, thank you so much for your time and your, your insight and your encouragement today. We appreciate it. Thank you, thanks for having me. We will now hear from Dr. Christy Arts, who will tackle some of the top questions that we get about raising a plant-powered family, especially with those children, and she'll talk about some of the obstacles and how to overcome them. All right, Dr. Arch, thank you so much for joining us today. We wanna to talk with you about raising a plant-powered family. Uh, and if you can, start off by just telling us your personal journey and how you got your kids on board and um, your family in line with doing this. Well, Leanne, I have three daughters and uh, they're all teenagers or preteens right now. So 12, 14, and 16 years old. Um, I would say our family really began this journey about the time that our oldest daughter was born. And I, my husband and I both, we had just finished our residency training and we were living in Philadelphia at the time and began to think about how are we going to feed this child? <laughs> and really discovering that there were a lot of gaps in our own nutrition knowledge, things that we hadn't learned in medical school, certainly that we hadn't learned um, when we were caring for patients in the hospital. And I began a journey of just educating myself as a parent, but also as a physician, reading material on nutritional science and discovering that there was so much that I needed to learn in order to raise my child in the best way that I thought was possible for her. And wanting to give her, you know, a really good start in terms of her nutrition, exposing her to different tastes and flavors and focusing on whole plant foods. Um, I was fortunate to live, um, my backyard neighbor at the time was a really fabulous cook as well, so um, she had young children of her own. So she and I would get together um, with our young kids and cook together, and she taught me a lot about using different herbs and spices and um, just making plants the center of the plate. And so that was where we began our journey um, as parents of young children, and then separately, uh, as a physician, as I explored the nutritional science, I knew that I needed to learn more in order to better treat patients. Um, as I learned how to apply this to my own family, uh, it became 
more and more apparent that I, that I really wanted to better understand how to bring this information to patients that I would care for in the future as well. You know, you Google this and all sorts of things come up. I'm wondering if there are any resources that you found especially helpful in your journey. There are so many wonderful books that are available at the library. You can order them, you know, to have them delivered to your home. But a book that was transformational to me was um, a book by Dr. Joel Furman called Eat to Live. And this was the initial book that I picked up and started you know, really beginning to understand what whole food plant-based nutrition was all about. And I also discovered that he was practicing medicine and had been doing so for about 20 years, uh, nutritional-based medicine. He was about an hour to an hour and a half north of where we were living in Philadelphia at the time. So I happened to send him an email and call his office to see if he'd be willing to have me come up and shadow him. Um, I, as I mentioned, I was a new practicing physician, um, splitting my time between working in the emergency department in downtown Philadelphia and then on my days off. Um, when I wasn't you know, caring for my, my young child, I would uh, go up to his medical practice in New Jersey and shadow him and understand how he was using um, this plant-based nutrition to really transform the health of patients that he was caring for. So it was a combination of both reading his book and then seeing how he uses this information to help patients. And then beyond that, it was how do I apply this in my own home? So I needed new cookbooks and different resources um, to understand how to apply this in my own home. Uh, the initial cookbook that I turned to and I actually still, I have my original copy, you know, this is, you know, a decade or so old now, but my original copy of the cookbook, Oh, She Glows. And um, it, it's just a really fun book to look at and it has really wonderful recipes. One of my favorite is still um, her spiced lentil soup, red lentil soup. And I cook that probably at least once or twice a month. My kids love it. Um, it's just a really comforting, warm soup, especially you know during cold winter months. What are the struggles, questions, concerns that you get from patients uh, that are trying to make the transition? Of course, I talk to a lot of um, parents who want to improve their own health. Maybe they've developed diabetes or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and in consultation with myself or someone else someone else on our lifestyle medicine team, um, when we recommend uh, moving toward a more whole food plant-based diet, oftentimes the biggest concern they have is, well, what do I do with my children? And how do I bring them along in this journey? Because I can't be making a meal both for them and then a separate meal for myself, which I completely agree with. Um, cooking for a family is a, a challenge already, and we want to be able to feed our family um, you know, in a way that works for everyone. Um, so that's a, an initial concern and, and a struggle, I would say, for many um, individuals who are looking to move toward a whole food plant-based diet. Um, we all have to start somewhere. So uh, oftentimes it means just beginning to have plate, uh, plants become more the center of the plate, um, choosing new vegetables, seasonal vegetables, oftentimes to expose um, not only our own palates, but the palates of our children. Um, and those can change very rapidly. That's the other um, really important piece of information I think to share is that just like um, adults, children can really rapidly change their palate if we expose them to different foods. And by exposing them, that means we often need to share that food with them, not just once or twice, but oftentimes, you know, a handful, maybe up to 10 times before they really begin to um, become accustomed to different tastes and flavors. Um, even within my own extended family, we have a lot of naysayers. So I um, experience this at family holidays and I still even get questions about um, focusing on a whole food plant-based diet for myself and my children. Uh, my response has become, I'm happy to share that information um, if they're ready to, 
to talk about it, if they want to learn more. Um, you know, what I see in terms of not only uh, a person who eats this plant-based lifestyle, this, this dietary pattern, but also the transformation that I see in the patients that I care for. Um, but I certainly don't try to impose it on anyone else. And, um, you know, bringing a lot of uh, sort of grace and curiosity into the conversation, I think is oftentimes the best approach. And of course, always sharing a delicious uh, plant-based dish uh, especially when you're with extended family or friends, for example, who might be new to plant-based eating. I can imagine that one of the questions you get from uh, perhaps the naysayers or maybe uh, uh, some others as well is, you know, don't our bodies need meat? Aren't we designed to eat meat? And what nutrients are we missing out on if we decide to go this direction? Yeah, it's a common concern that um, people have. And even when they look at well, not so much now that my, my children have grown beautifully and they're healthy and they don't get sick very often, so I get fewer questions about whether it's safe for my own children because clearly they're thriving um, and their health is wonderful. Um, to the extent that, you know, I, I take them in for their annual wellness check with their pediatrician and then beyond that, we really never need to see our own pediatrician because our children just are healthy and they do well. If they happen to get a cold, they recover quickly. Um, so in terms of uh, a plant-based diet, if it's nutritionally adequate for um, young children, uh, you know, elementary school age and adolescents, absolutely 100%. It is nutritionally adequate. They will receive plenty amounts of um, protein, uh, plant-based proteins in their diet. Um, they will get exposed to all the micronutrients or those vitamins and minerals that are essential for our bodies to you know, thrive and be healthy and resistant to infections you know, so that we have a good immune system. Um, I'll sometimes get questions about, well, where do you get a source of calcium if children aren't eating dairy? And there's great uh, plant-based sources from whole foods. For example, broccoli and green leafy vegetables, almonds, even tofu. Um, so these are all really common um, foods that we can find at the supermarket um, and that can be brought into your child's diet and certainly you know, the whole family can enjoy these foods. Um, we always have on hand frozen fruits and vegetables. So um, when everybody is busy, you know, my husband and I are both working, our children are in school, they have after school activities. So every day there's a lot of activity and oftentimes not a lot of time to plan meals. Um, so doing the best that we can to um, make meal plans on the weekends if it's possible and then always making sure to have on hand um, those really high nutrient dense um, frozen fruits and vegetables, cans of beans, whole grains that we've cooked possibly in advance, and then usually a soup. Soup is always on the menu, especially in the winter time. Um, it's a really easy thing to throw together um, to cook a large batch of soup that we can have throughout the week um, and is always a go-to option in our family. Of course, anytime we're trying something uh, for the whole family, the kids are a primary concern. Um, do you conduct this in such a way where your kids go about it the same way as you do, or do you have any special uh, nutrition concerns when it comes to the children, uh, things that you might do a little different for them? Certainly no nutrition concerns um, in regard to, you know, are they getting enough nutrients or protein? You know, I, I feel incredibly confident that they're getting all the uh, nutrition that they need um, for their bodies to grow and, and remain healthy. I would say the piece, um, particularly with adolescent children and the phase that phase of life that we're in with our family is to ensure that they understand how to make um, great choices on their own. Um, you know, at some point they're going to be leaving our home and, you know, pursuing um, their own lives. And uh, so making sure that they have a really strong foundation and understanding um, how to feed themselves properly. Um, so what we find is modeling, you know, great nutrition is probably the best thing that we can do now as a parent to always have, you know, healthy 
uh, nutrient dense fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, you know, beans and legumes, having these foods available, having our children see their parents eat, eating these foods. Um, that's really the best nutrition advice I feel that I can offer to my children right now. Um, certainly when we go out to restaurants, which you know is rare, but we from time to time will go to restaurants, exposing them to different um, world cuisines has been a really um, fun way to keep them eating in a more whole food plant-based pattern. But sometimes they want to choose a meat-based option on the menu, and that's a choice that we allow our children to make. Um, we certainly will not dictate what they eat. We want them to have healthy um, you know, relationship with food and to understand how to nourish their bodies adequately. And, um, but we try in our home to really protect that space. I would say that's the biggest thing that I focus on now is there are so many influences outside of the home, whether it's at school or you know, at friends' houses, but um, ensuring that what we have in our own home really models the food and nutrition that we feel is important for their health um, and, and having them learn through that process. Uh, you talk about uh, leaving some choices open for your children. Uh, with the younger ones, though, I imagine that that can get trickier. Do you find that you have to have a firmer hand with the younger children? Again, I think in some ways it's easier. <laughs> you know, I can reflect back now when my children were younger, and while there's certainly many challenges and struggles and, you know, obviously great moments when children are quite small, we also have much more control over what they're eating, and they have less exposure to, you know, food outside of the home, for example. Um, so I would say, you know, do the best that you can. There's no, there, no one is giving you a grade in terms of how you're, or you know, or, or making a judgment on how you're feeding your family. I think the more you focus on modeling great eating behaviors, um, having meals that are not distracted by screens and phones, enjoying conversation with your family, even if it's not every single day, but trying you know, maybe it's once a week that you uh, really dedicate time to a family meal where everybody sits at the table, looks each other in the eye, um, puts their screens away, um, and really enjoying a meal. And if it can be whole food plant-based, that's even better. Um, or if you're in the process of transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet, um, letting a, a meal that we really like, um, that I think is easy for everyone is, um, plant-based um, taco type meal where we might roast some sweet potatoes and have black beans and then greens and cilantro and everybody can sort of customize and choose how they want to build their taco. And meals like that that are a little bit um, de uh, deconstructed so that children can decide, well, I want to have this on my plate and maybe not that tonight. Um, those are really fun ways to make it easier for the whole family to enjoy the same meal, but everybody can customize it a little bit for themselves. And then sitting down and enjoying that meal together, that's really the most important thing. And let's face it, our society is not designed for a plant-based lifestyle, from marketing in the grocery stores to when you're driving down the street in fast food restaurants. Um, how do you get around some of those societal pressures uh, that really fight against this? I would agree. Our environment certainly takes us in a direction away from health, and that's really why we're offering this material, too, through the Plant Power Challenge, is that there are so many opportunities to improve your health um, through your diet and lifestyle choices, and um, so hopefully the material that you know, each of you is learning through the Plant Power Challenge will help better equip you to feel like you can um, create a lifestyle that supports your health. On the flip side, I would say I'm seeing a lot of um, great information that's available around eating more whole food plant-based. I think there's a real recognition um, in the wider community, not only for personal health reasons, but also environmental health. Um, I think that speaks to a lot of um, people in younger generations. You know, millennials are really leading a movement around eating more whole food plant-based 
foods in order to protect the health of the planet. So there's lots of different reasons that people might choose to um, move toward a, whole, a more whole food plant-based diet. And I think tapping into the reasons why this might be beneficial to you or why this might be exciting or something new that you want to try, um, you know, there's, there's multitude of reasons. And certainly raising a family, eating more whole food uh, plant-based will allow your family to thrive. I've seen it personally, I've seen it professionally as I've cared for other, you know, families that have, you know, young children or adolescent children in their homes. Um, your health will thrive. You often find also that your food bills might be even cheaper. So that's an extra benefit of eating more whole plant foods and um, you know eating things like beans and legumes that are incredibly cost effective um, when you're on a budget for feeding a family. Dr. Christy Arts, thank you so much for sharing your uh, professional and personal insights. We appreciate it. Thank you, Leon. A big thank you to everyone who joined us for today's session to learn more about raising plant-powered children. We hope the insight and advice from our doctors helps you to raise your own plant-powered family.